Hello, everyone. Welcome to Triple V, a show dedicated towards advancing the message of a free society. I'm your host, Mike Shanklin. Today, I'm joined with a really special guest. His name is Stefan Kinsella. Stefan actually attended Louisiana State University, where he earned a Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science degrees in Electrical Engineering, and a Juris Doctor from uh, Paul M. Hebert Law Center, excuse me if I pronounce that incorrectly. He also obtained an LLM at the University of London. Kinsella is a registered patent attorney, a libertarian theorist and lecturer, and the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, C4SIF, and founding and executive editor of the Libertarian Papers, and blogger at the Libertarian Standard, a very active gentleman. You can find more of Stefan's work over at Mises.org or at his website, StefanKinsella.com. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Michael. Good to be here. Yeah, glad to have you on the show. Before we get into the, the, the meat and potatoes, the real details here, I always ask everybody who comes on my show uh, two important questions. Obviously, I'm sure you know these already. The first one is, what is your philosophy and how do you get it across to others? I think that's a very vital question to start with. Sure. Um, well, as for the first, uh, my philosophy, um, my political views are libertarian, and I can explain my, my particular variant of that. Um, and that integrates into my other philosophy of life, which I don't think is as relevant, but um, you know, the, the general idea of being a good person, being a good neighbor, trying to live a good life, all that kind of jazz. But in terms of political philosophy, uh, a libertarian of the sort of Rothbardian, um, uh, heavily objectivist influence. Uh, but I am an anarchist, and I am a uh, um, Objectivist in the sense that I am not a skeptic. I don't believe that morals are relative. I don't believe that um, we can't know reality in the universe. So um, I'm 47. I've been a lawyer since I was, you know, my mid 20s, and um, I've been a sort of a religious skeptic and uh, and state skeptic since I've been about 16 years old. Primarily, initially because of Ayn Rand's influence, and then later the uh, the the uh, the uh, the more anarchist writers like Rothbard and the Tanner Hills and people like that. Um, so basically, I am in favor of peace. I'm in favor of society, civilization, cooperation, productivity, prosperity, and finding a way that people can live together in a peaceful, productive way. I'm totally in favor of capitalism and uh, prosperity and industrialism in the modern age and technology. Uh, nothing against that at all. Um, uh, but I'm also in favor of you know peace and individualism, and uh, uh, and of course libertarianism as the means to achieve that. Uh, to me, libertarianism is just the systematic, consistent application of the common sense idea that most people have, which is that we should live and let live, and live in peace with our neighbors, and work things out in a reasonable, peaceful way when we have disputes. Um, as far as how you get the ideas out there, well, that's a challenge. That's a, to my mind, that's more of a strategic issue. I mean, there's two fundamental approaches you can take, that you can just live your life and try to be a good person and try to be successful in your whatever you think success means, you know, family life, career, uh, peace, civil liberties, that kind of thing. Um, and you could also try to work as an application or as a hobby or as a side pursuit or even as part of your life project, try to work for liberty, which is what I do um, to a certain degree. And one way to achieve that is to try to live a good life and to try to uh, lead by the power of example. That is, if you are a successful person who has their stuff together, the kind of person people come to for advice or for help when they need help, and they know that you have your stuff together, you have a, a good life, you're successful, you're positive, then, then they're going to be more receptive to your message of liberty when it comes up. I don't think being a bore is the way to do it. I don't think being always in the face of people and intruding on their space and just taking every chance you can get to lecture them on libertarianism is the way to go, although I'm, I sometimes um, uh, am guilty of doing that, of course. Um, I think it's just over time people see there's a solid, good, intelligent person who actually integrates this philosophy into their life, and so you're not going to just laugh off their ideas as the, as the ravings of some nut. You know, when they when we start talking about getting rid of the Fed or cutting back on the police or war, um, there's a certain sincerity and a credibility that you you acquire by being a good person integrated into normal life in other ways. Yeah, I completely agree. So basically, a consensual based uh, agreement based society that that is peace, 
and then living by example to help spread that message. Obviously, uh, you've gone above and beyond that too. So congratulations on that. <laughs> but, but you know, how did you get to this point? Really, there's got to. I mean, obviously, you, you talked about Ten Hills and uh, you know Rand and all that stuff, but. You know, were you private schooled, public schooled, homeschooled? Did your parents practice peaceful parenting? Um, were your parents apolitical, political? What kind of environment were you as a child, and how did if, did you have to escape it? Like for me, I had to escape st a statist family. Um, not that I'm not friends and family, you know, with my family members, but um, I, I had to. I came from a pretty statist family. Uh, I, almost all my family was in the military, and uh, we can go on for this for hours. But anyway, I came from a status family. I was I was curious to to where your background, you know, how did you get to this message? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of biographical, and uh, my personal story uh, is personal, of course. But uh, the, the 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 basic is, um, I was um, I was adopted, okay, into a family, a, a middle class family in Louisiana. Um, in the, and I lived in a rural setting, uh, you know, like on a quasi farm area. Um, uh, I went to private Catholic schools, uh, my life, all my life, um, until college. And, um, I think that in my case, being a, I was also small, like small framed when I was younger and sort of a late bloomer and I was a smart ass. So I got picked on a lot by bullies, even, even at private Catholic schools, you know, you just can't get away from bullies. Um, my parents were sort of blue dog Democrats, conservative Democrats. They weren't that political. I kind of thought I was a Democrat when I thought about it until I – I think I registered to vote when I was 18, and I registered Democrat just because my parents you know, said we were Democrats, but I never had voted Democrat. My first vote was for Reagan, and after that, it's been Libertarian, and after that, I don't vote anymore. So that's been my progression. But I think that when I was young and being bullied and also being adopted – it made me very sort of naturally individualist and also naturally um, opposed to injustice. The injustice of bullying and the individualism of being adopted is you don't care about all this uh, sort of uh, uh, atavistic family-related crap. You just care about your own achievements. So when a librarian at my Catholic high school introduced me to Ayn Rand's uh, fiction in like 10th or 11th grade, I just devoured it because I resonated with that message. So I became a hardcore – and up until that time, I was basically agnostic. I mean I knew nothing. I had no opinions on philosophy. I was into science. So when I started understanding there was a whole field of argumentation and inquiry about economics and justice, it just, uh, uh, it just appealed to me greatly, and it just fascinated me. And Ayn Rand's sort of individualistic, uh, quasi-anti-state – pro-free market, pro-individual rights uh, perspective really appealed to me. Um, at first, I didn't read the other type of libertarians because she also said libertarianism is evil. It's not what we believe. So I believed her because she made so much sense on other things. Um, <laughs> so I actually didn't read. Like I saw some libertarian party pamphlets and things like this at, at LSU when I was first starting in 1984. And I just ignored it because I figured they were just – poisoned and confused people, but I, I couldn't help but noticing similarities, right? Like they seem to be saying the same thing that, <laughs> that Ayn Rand says in her, quote, capitalist wing of her philosophy. So I finally read Rothbard and uh, the Tannehills and, and everyone else and uh, just broadened my uh, perspective and uh, sort of left Randianism behind in some senses. So that's that's kind of my story about how I got involved in it. But for me, it's always been a passion about truth and consistency and justice and wanting to know the truth about things and trying to be a good person and applying those those ideas uh, in a consistent uh, uh, societal way. No, good stuff. I'm 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 loving this interview so far. <laughs> so let's get into IP. Let's jump right into it. Um, I'm going to let you kind of go over the IP sure. thing. I, I don't even know sure. where to start on IP really. Sure. So uh, go into your spiel on IP, and I'll ask a bunch. Of, I got a bunch of questions from yeah. from my audience that, that, that they want to ask you and drill you on. So go for it. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. Uh, so uh, you know, I uh, throughout law school and until I started writing my first articles, I was always interested in uh, rights theory, like how we justify our rights and define property rights, and economics and epistemology, all these kind of issues, uh, Austrian economics, these kind of things that a lot of us get into. Um, Anarchy theory, anarchist theory, private defense agency, that kind of stuff. And to be honest, that's still my main my main interest. But I started 
I, I remember reading Ayn Rand had a chapter in her, I think it's Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and I think I was in law school when I read that, or maybe earlier, um, and it was on patents and copyrights. And it sort of relates to her theory of property, too, about how man has to have secure property rights in his creations because the whole purpose of human life is productive sort of labor or human action, and so it's natural that you have to have some kind of legal protection for the output of your product productivity. Um, and then she just extends that to the idea of intellectual property. Um, and her argument for IP is a bizarre you – know, it's kind of like utilitarian. Like she talks about how it makes sense that copyrights only last for 70 years plus after death or whatever it was at the time, and patents only last for about 17 years. But you can see she's straining to justify these sort of artificial legal systems um, because if you own a car or a house, you don't own it for a fixed number of years. You own it until – you get rid of it, right, or until it is destroyed. I mean, you own it forever, theoretically. So there's something odd about the idea of IP, and her argument for it just didn't make sense to me. I was like, what was the general case? Because she was finding a way to – I think what happened was Ayn Rand came to America from Russia. She saw how great this country was compared to the basically the Soviet Union, and so she fell in love with it, and she thought that the Constitution and the founders were geniuses, and they were basically – Presumptively right, presumptively right on everything, unless she came up with a good reason against it. In fact, I heard that she originally was for eminent domain, you know, the state taking private property because it's, it's contemplated by the Fifth Amendment, um, um, and so she assumed it had to be legitimate. And then she finally rejected that idea because she is a little bit too principled for that. But she never did get over her accepting of the American tradition of patent and copyright, which is blessed by the Constitution. Um, so I think Ayn Rand was trying to bend over backwards to come up with a way to fit this artificial legal privilege, which is in our constitution, into her growing harmonious theory of natural rights, which is somewhat overlapping and compatible with the theory of the founders, but not completely. Right. So I think she tried a little too hard, and I think that shows for anyone who tries to read that a little too closely. And in, uh, when I started practicing <laughs> law in 92 uh, – I started practicing uh, patent law, and so I started thinking harder about this issue. And within about a year or two, I'd finally admitted to myself, you know, this is a futile project. I cannot, I can't rehabilitate Rand's contorted arguments on property on IP. She was wrong, and then I started understanding a lot more. And this is the topic of the day. I think IP is one of the top five or six worst things the state does, and people are coming to realize that because because of the Internet, basically. The Internet reveals to us on a daily basis examples of the abuses that the IP system lets the government foist on people and, and, and business people too. Um, and it also magnifies the effects of it, like copyright. Like you know, There was no widespread piracy before the Internet, so now piracy is happening. So copyright law causes the government to crack down on people. So I started getting into the topic of IP because I practiced it, and I, I was interested in libertarian theory. Um, and although it's still honestly not my main interest, um, it, it has required me to integrate it into a more coherent and overall holistic view of libertarian property rights. So understanding IP, I think, helps you have a better understanding of the function – and purpose of justice and property rights and law um, in the first place. So they, they complement each other. So so you want to, that's kind of my overview of how I came to it. But you can think of intellectual property as a, as a subset of state law, which deals with protecting what they call creations of the mind. Okay, And that includes patent and copyright and trademark and trade secret and some other more recent special laws. Um, the two main ones are patent and copyright. So patents are basically legal monopolies the government grants to inventors of a new invention uh, in exchange for them disclosing publicly in a written patent application document filed with the public or made public to everyone um, that gives them a protection from competition for about 17 years. And copyrights basically automatically grants people who create artistic works like a novel or a movie or a play or a painting uh, or software um, grants them exclusive rights to prevent people from copying or utilizing in certain ways for up to 70 years after your death. 
Um, so these are – I think the right way to look at these laws is um, – you, are you're familiar with restrictive covenants and like neighborhood, associ- neighborhood associations, right? Yeah. And things like rights of use or easements. So, easements, so let's right. Say, yeah, so let's say that you have a, a piece of land and you your neighbor says, look, I have to walk all the way around your property to get to the uh, the town every day. I'd like the right to cut across the corner of your property, and I'll I'll, I'll pay you something, a hundred bucks a year, or I'll let you um, graze your cows in my pay. You know, I'll pay, I'll give you some compensation, but I'd like this right because it will help me. So basically, you're contractually transferring a, a part of your property rights in your field to someone else. Now that's perfectly legitimate to divide up your property by contract or by sale, right? Because you did it voluntarily. But if the government just gave your neighbor the right to cross your field, um, they passed a law saying, you know, Farmer Jones has the right to cross against uh, Michael's property whenever he wants. We would re- we would regard that as a taking of property rights. It'd be transferring part of your property rights to someone else. So the problem is not that he has the right to do it. The problem is that you didn't consent to it. You didn't voluntarily do it. So in, in the law, we would call that a, a negative servitude. Uh, well, actually, that's a, that's an easement. But a negative servitude is a type of that, like in a, in, a, in a restrictive covenant or a neighborhood association. You might have 10 or 15 or 100 neighbors all sign an agreement saying that none of us will use our homes for commercial use or for a pig farm, or we won't paint our doors some garish, ugly orange color that will hurt the neighborhood's overall <laughs> value. People agree to this, and this is called a negative servitude. It means your neighbors have a veto right over how you can use your property in certain narrowly defined ways. And again, like the easement, that is perfectly legitimate if it's done consensually and contractually. What patent and copyright do is they effectively give the holder of the patent or the holder of the copyright a negative servitude granted by the state, which gives them the right to prevent other people from using their property in certain ways. So it's like a negative servitude that was never consented to by the burden of the state, we call it. So, for example, if I have a copyright in the movie Star Wars, I can prevent you from using your own property to make a Star Wars sequel right, or to write a novel. I can prevent you from printing on your own printer on your own pieces of paper and selling this to people, um, the sequel that you wrote. So it's like a veto right now, and I can use that to force you to pay me a license to get out of that, right? right. Or if I have a patent on a new mousetrap, I can prevent you from making your own mousetrap with your own property, although in the natural state of society, I would have no right to do that So unless you agreed to it. But so the government basically grants these negative servitudes to people without, without the consent of the burden of the state. So this is the fundamental problem with intellectual property is that it basically – takes property rights away from owners who already own existing material property and transfers part of that property right to these beneficiaries of patent and, and copyright. That's the fundamental problem with it. It's a taking, it's theft by the government. Yeah, so it's, it's not just an exclusion uh, per se. It's the transfer of, of property. It's the theft. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. Good analogy right there. Um, I actually have Pika Chan. He wants me to ask you, um, if you can define, if we can all define intellectual property and copyright laws as artificial scarcity, or whether it is objectively something else. So I think what he's getting at there is the, the original basis for property. The, the very reason that there is such a thing as property is because of the fundamental fact of scarcity, or you can call it rivalrousness. In other words, we live in a world where there are some usable things right that are useful in our human actions to accomplish our goals but which are scarce which that means rivalrous which means you can have conflict over them in other words only one person can use this thing at a time like um, you know if I want to use a, um, um, a fishing net to catch fish I only I can use that net if you if you want to use the net to catch fish you have to physically take it from me so that we would have violent conflict over it so the purpose the very essence of property is to allocate one owner of a given resource that is otherwise subject to conflict so that it can be used peacefully and productively. You allocate it in a way that sets up this kind of visible borders so people know 
what the property is, what its boundaries are, and who owns it. There's some kind of association between the owner and the thing. And that way people – at least the people that want to be civilized and live in peace and to respect each other's rights, they know what to avoid. They know not to step onto your property. They know that it's your net, etc. Right. So that's the very function of property. If we didn't have scarcity, the very concept of property would be literally impossible. It would make no sense. It would be – not only would it be unnecessary, it would be inconceivable to have property. If we lived in this kind of uh, magical, ghostly realm – of infinite prosperity where everyone basically was magical and you could just snap your fingers and have whatever you wanted at any time, then the idea of property makes no sense because it, it, it wouldn't even be possible to take something from someone. Right. And even if you did, you could just recreate it right away. So all these ideas make sense only as a way to deal with the problem of scarcity. So what happens is in the field of IP, yes, sometimes the defenders of IP they, they describe what they're trying to do as trying to create artificial scarcity because what they see is that in the physical world, there is scarcity, and by that I mean lack of abundance. Like right. we all don't have enough of the things we really want. We don't have enough large houses. We don't have enough good new cars. We don't have enough plentiful food, etc. If you could have more, it would be better. Luckily, the free market – lets us produce abundance in the face of the fundamental fact of scarcity, so it's a good thing. It's a way of overcoming scarcity because of um, the division of labor and you know, free energy of people cooperating, etc. Um, but uh, but I, I think the, it's, it's only a med- – so what happens is people start understanding economics, and they say, how is it possible that we have prosperity in this world of scarcity? And they understand that the free market has incentives and profit motive and all this and cooperation, division of labor. It lets it happen. And so they start thinking like economists or like utilitarians trying to come up with rules that instead of doing justice that has a beneficial result, they come up with rules that have the result. In other words, they're trying to tweak these rules to achieve a result in society. So they start thinking like central planners. What rules can we, the government, impose on society that will – Give the right incentives to do the right things. So then they start thinking. They start. They start thinking about uh, the, the the problem of the commons, right? When you have the tragedy of the commons, when you don't have carefully defined property rights, and you have a waste. And they start thinking that when you have privatized and internalized costs, then you have incentives to be efficient and all these things. And so they start thinking, well, that must apply to value in general, and certainly. Knowledge and ideas are valuable, and certainly we want to encourage people to have knowledge and spread knowledge and acquire knowledge and develop new technologies. Uh, so we need to apply similar types of rules there. And unfortunately, there's no scarcity in this world because ideas and patterns and recipes and information are infinitely reproducible. A billion people can use the same fishing technique at the same time or the same cake recipe at the same time. So it's not scarce like land is. Okay, So the scarcity of the physical world leads us to have to come up with property rules that al- allow them to be used peacefully and that has all these beneficial effects like good incentives and tragedy of the commons is overcome, etc. So you have these people that say, well, intangible things like ideas are also valuable, so let's but unfortunately, they're scarce. Now, here's their mistake when they say, unfortunately, they're scarce, because actually it would be great if everything that was scarce wasn't scarce. It would be great if we all had infinite bananas and infinite water, infinite clean water, infinite energy. That would be a good thing, and the free market is trying to get us closer to that, but it can't go all the way because we live in a physical world. So what they do is, perversely, they come up with a system that says, let's take these things that are unscarce or non-scarce, and let's try to make them scarce – so that the same kind of incentive effects work on them that work in the scarce world. But they sort of forget that the whole reason we need these incentive effects in the scarce world is because they're actually scarce. And we have to ration. We have no choice but to ration. We have no choice but to allocate only one user at a time because that's the way it is. If you could have two people use the same bicycle at the same time, who would object to that? It makes no sense. Um, so what they do is they pass laws that – Try to impose scarcity on ideas. Now, in my view, and this is not my view as a political theorist or a libertarian. It's more my view as an economist. 
it is literally impossible to have property rights and ideas. I mean, literally. And it's literally impossible to make an idea scarce. That's just not their nature. They cannot be owned. What they, what they end up doing, so if, if this goes back to my negative servitude example, really what it is, it's like a disguised way of transferring property. So for example, an analogy would be when people say, um, people have fought over religion for millennia. Well, actually that's not literally true. What people fight over is scarce resources, always. So, for example, if I'm a Muslim and I kill you because you, you're a Christian and you won't convert to, to Muslim, then I'm really fighting over – you and I are fighting over who gets the right to control your body. right? That's the fight. That's the dispute. Now, my reason for trying to take over your body is because of my religious views, but that's just my purpose or motivation. That's not what we're fighting over. We're always fighting over a scarce thing. So whenever anyone wants a property right in an idea, that's literally impossible because you can't control an idea. You can't put a fence around an idea. All you can do is use it as an excuse to take other people's property. So for example, Jamie Thomas, the woman who downloaded a few songs or uploaded a few songs to the internet a few years ago and now is liable for a few hundred thousand dollars because of copyright, really the dispute is about who owns the money in her bank account. So. The, the RIAA or whichever studio is suing her is really using this copyright excuse as a claim as an excuse to go after the money in her bank account. Okay, And if they succeed, then ultimately what happens is they get the ownership of her money instead of her. So the dispute is over her money. But if you go back to libertarian first principles, she owned her money, and you own your property unless you do one of two things, unless you contractually give it away, which she did not. Or you commit a tort or a crime, and then you invade someone else's property so that you cause them damage, and then you owe them restitution. She didn't do that either. <laughs> Sorry, I had to sneeze right then. Okay. <laughs> no, good stuff. Um, so I completely agree with you. Once again, who would have thought? Um, m moving on, actually, this is a very important, you know, it's kind of like we're jumping back into graduate school, you and I, and we're going to be looking yep. at case law one more time, so let's go into yep. a case real quick. Sure. Nathan, Nathan Frazier uh, asks, um, he wants to talk about Adam Schwartz. He's, he, he wrote a nice little thing here. I'm just going to summarize Eric, it real Eric, quick. Eric Schwartz. Yeah, uh, uh, Adam Schwartz? What was it? Eric Schwartz? Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Schwartz. Yeah, Aaron Schwartz. What did I say, Adam? Sorry. Schwartz. Aaron Schwartz. Yeah, so what, I, want, I want to hear your opinion on, on – some people never even heard about that, so let's kind of give this a, you know, a chance to uh, – an opportunity to at least spread what happened to him, and then I want to hear your reasoning. Sure. Yeah, so Aaron Schwartz, who uh, committed suicide recently at the age of 26, I believe, he was a brilliant, young, tech-savvy guy who I think he went to college really early, and he got involved in a lot of um, uh, very important projects like uh, RSS protocol and uh, uh, I think Reddit, things like that early on. And he, he was instrumental in helping to defeat SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act from last year. So this is a guy, but he had this, I think he was sort of a, uh, one of these kind of tech open, open source civil libertarian types. I don't think he was a libertarian exactly. He had a lot of good instincts though pushing in our direction. He, he basically saw some fundamental injustice, something wrong with the idea of, of information being locked up. So one of his early projects was he um, he hacked – I don't know if he hacked into, but he somehow got access to this case database, this legal database called PACER, P-A-C-E-R. It's, it's, it's an all-caps system that a lot of lawyers use, and basically it's the system where they collect – publicly reported judicial decisions and cases from courts around the country, and they put it into this database that lawyers pay to access. The thing is, under U.S. law, all these government documents are public domain. There's no copyright in these cases, and of course it would be perverse to have a copyright in them if we have the doctrine which we have in the U.S. that ignorance of the law is no excuse. I mean if we're going to be held to account for violating the artificial – and huge millions of laws database of the country, of, of the governments, we at least should have access to know what the hell they are. I mean if the government could copyright them and put them behind a paywall, then that's just adding insult to injury or adding damage to damage or however you want to put it, right? I mean at least we should be able to look up the damn laws we're supposed to follow, right? Really? To, to know what we have to do to avoid going to their – being stuck in a government cage. Especially since, what is it, every every day the average American breaks three felonies? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. yeah. 
Yeah, and in the copyright case, uh, I've seen uh, studies that estimate that um, every one of us, on average, potentially is uh, is liable for about four point five billion dollars of damages from copyright statutory damages alone, just from average internet activities like cutting and pasting an article, sending it to your friends, that kind of stuff. So the law is truly obscene, and it of course allows. When you have so many laws and they're not rooted in natural justice, and there's so many of them, it allows prosecutors to have discretion in what they enforce. So everyone's a criminal, so they can basically turn the screws on whoever they want. But in any case, so Swartz liberated the Pacer database, and I think the DOJ, Department of Justice, was considering pursuing him, but they dropped it because he really didn't violate any copyright because it's not subject to copyright. Well, his most latest uh, uh, sort of uh, antic or whatever you want to call it, was he went to MIT and he he he, he took about um, or he copied about you know several million art- academic articles from the JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R database, which is a very expensive private database. Um, now, this is full of material that's largely copyrighted, but it's academic stuff that – like the professors didn't sell it. They just published it in some journal, right? So it's – it's, it's 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 copyright, but it's it's not really for profit stuff by and large. And he took these millions of articles. He got them from a MIT um, um, a clo- a closet. He stuck his laptop in there and just downloaded them. He got around the firewalls and all that kind of stuff with his you know his techniques. And so of course the Department of Justice goes after him, and uh, they basically have him threatened with three to five decades of life in federal prison. Um, now they probably would have used that to extort a plea deal from him. Maybe six years, maybe six months. I don't know. But even six months in federal prison for a 26-year-old guy who – and probably he would have had to agree not to use the internet for like life for 10 years or something, and this is his life. So he was despairing, and uh, now I think he had psychological problems too because um, uh, I don't think he, most people would commit suicide even over that. But he, he did. He committed suicide. Um, I think he just – he was giving a big – F you to the government. He wasn't going to put up with it, and he couldn't live like that. And um, I admire his outrage and his um, his kind of courage and his sense of justice. He he just wouldn't submit. Uh, but it's very sad because he was pushed to that by the government. So I view that I think copyright law killed him. Basically, it's it's what in in law we would say that's the proximate cause of his death. The proximate cause of his death is the federal government and copyright law. And so I think every single person, especially libertarians who are sympathetic to copyright law, should take a minute and think about that. Here's this, some innocent guy who gave us a lot. He didn't do anything wrong in a libertarian sense. All he did wrong was maybe commit a minor act of trespass in a closet of MIT. But that's a private civil matter between MIT and him. It has nothing to do with the data he copied. Um, so uh, – uh, I think that everyone who's in favor of copyright should kind of hang their head in shame uh, because they're a little bit morally complicit in this guy's murder. Yeah, I, go, I agree. Um, Wayne, Wayne Padgett wants me to, to – uh, well, he actually has a really good topic here. He says, if intellectual property disputes were handled in civil court instead of criminal court, he says he might be inclined to support it m- moreover. Uh, however, to define it as a criminal act – and to prosecute it in the same courtroom as murder and rape is intellectual dishonesty. Maybe this comes back. I read an uh, article from Rothbard a while back where he was talking about, obviously, patents are just, there's no way you can justify a patent. But maybe some form of natural or common law would, would have some form of copyright just, you know, uh, in the essence because if somebody writes something and creates it, we all know we all know Einstein's work, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> we don't have to really yep. go around. If somebody else copies Einstein's work, we still know it's Einstein's. But, you know, looking at this, and maybe we could move into the Ron Paul versus RonPaul.com issue here, too. Sure. That's sure. obviously a big thing. So I'll let you – go ahead. You're, you're a good speaker. You know what you're saying. Go ahead. Well, first of all, patents are enforced by and large in civil courts, um, and they're totally unjust. And copyrights are by and large enforced in the civil courts as well. I mean if you, if you get a, a, a lawsuit from um, the MPAA for uploading a copy of a movie – now, yeah, sometimes they're enforced criminally, too, the copyright law. But even even the civil even civil enforcement is devastating. I mean, um, I think the Jamie Thomas thing was civil. I mean, this, this poor woman is like uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. Um, and if she doesn't pay, they can take her house or whatever. They can garnish her wages. I mean, she she'll be paying it off for the rest of her life, uh, perhaps. Uh, so I don't think the civil thing is going to help. 
Um, on the Rothbard issue, Rothbard, listen, Rothbard uh, was just – he went down a dead end on this issue. I think he made a mistake. Um, Me too. Rothbard was actually – if you read his chapter in Ethics of Liberty on um, knowledge, true and false, he has a really good explanation of why he's against defamation law, which is libel and slander or, or what some people call reputation rights which in my view is just another type of IP. It's based upon the same idea that if you work, you put labor or effort into something, and you create something of economic value, you have some property right in it. This is the Randian idea, and in fact, the Randians are in favor of defamation law. Uh, and Rothbard explained that, look, you can't have a property right in, in what other people think about you because you don't own their brains. Um, and in fact, the, the Austrian view of, of value is subjective. That is, there's not like some intrinsic substance or quality inside of an object that gives it value. Value is a subjective process. Right. You demonstrate it in your action. So, you, if I own a, you know, a, 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 an iPad, you know, it's it's valuable to me, and I could sell it to someone. And it has value for that reason. It's only because of our actions, and it, the value derives from its objective functionality and property. But the property right is only in the physical thing itself. You don't have a property right in what its value is. In other words, it might be worth two hundred dollars today. It might be worth one hundred fifty tomorrow if a new model comes out, right? My used iPad, let's say. So yeah. I did, but my property rights weren't invaded just because the value fell because I don't have a property right in value. And, and Hoppe explains this too. You only have the property right in the physical integrity of the objective borders of your scarce resource that you have acquired either by homesteading it from the unowned state of nature or by contract from a previous owner. I mean that's, that's what property rights are that basically exhaust the entire field of property. Those two principles answer everything. Any potential thing that can be contested, any scarce resource in the world… Theoretically or in principle, you could answer the question, who owns it, by asking who got it first or who who sold it to who. I mean it's very simple. Um, that answers everything. You don't, you don't ever have to ask, well, who, who made its value go up or down, etc. So what Rothbard said in that chapter was actually – if you extend his reasoning, it would be against trademarks. It would be against patenting and copyright. Now, in his other chapter in the Man, Economy, and State, he has a few – comments about this too, about patent and copyright. And he shoots down patent, um, and he shoots down state-granted copyright, but then he talks about there being contractual copyright. And I think what he had in mind there was this. If you own a, a mousetrap – now, again, he's a little bit confused here because he uses a copyright idea, but a mousetrap would be something subject to patent because it's an invention. But So it's not really clear what he meant by this, but… What he said was if you own a mousetrap and you don't want people to copy it, then if you sell it to a customer, you could make them contractually agree that they're only getting the mousetrap but not the right to copy it. Now, I interpret that to mean if you're a buyer of a product, you could enter into a contract obligating yourself not to do certain things with it. I agree that you could do that. I think it's a very unlikely contract to catch on because… I think Jeff Tucker in a recent um, interview talked about suppose you're selling potatoes, and right next to you is another guy selling potatoes, and he's selling general purpose potatoes for a dollar a pound. Now, I'm selling paid potatoes for a dollar a pound, but I have a stipulation or, or I have a, a condition that I make everyone sign that buys potatoes from me. You can only use these potatoes for, uh, for, for french fries. That's the only thing you can use them for, right? Now… Why would someone pay me a dollar a pound for potatoes that has a limitation on what they can do with it? It makes no sense. I would have to lower my price to compete with, with Tucker. you know. And if I lower my price, I'm going to have less profit. And if I have less profit, then in the long run on the free market, this kind of ridiculous practice will get weeded out. I mean it just makes no sense. Moreover, I, either I have to put a big penalty or a small penalty for violating this breach. So I say, and if you use the potatoes to make potato pancakes… Then you owe me a penny, or I say, or you owe me a million dollars. Now, what idiot is going to buy a dollar's worth of potatoes and potentially obligate himself towards a million-dollar fine for, for using them in my own home in a way that the, the seller, for some bizarre reason, doesn't want me to? No one's going to sign this, 
And the same thing is true for inventions or for books or software. If you're if someone's offering a book, you know, I won't buy a beach thriller. I'm going to Florida next week. I want to have a book to read. And this guy says, Here's my five dollar book, but you gotta sign on the dotted line and you gotta to promise to pay me ten million dollars. If you ever let anyone else borrow this book or if you ever write a sequel that's anything like it, or if you ever learn anything from it whatsoever, then you owe me a ten million dollars. <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna buy that book. I'm going to go pirate the book, or I'm going to buy a book from another guy that's a more reasonable seller. Right? Yeah. So these kinds of terms are ridiculous. The only term you would agree to would be something trivial, like a slap on the wrist, like, all right, I owe you 10 cents, fine. But then that's not going to deter piracy. Yeah. So this whole contractual argument makes no sense. But anyway, even if you assume it makes sense, what, what Rothbard says is, okay, so the buyer of this mousetrap can't use the mousetrap in certain ways. He can't make copies of it, and he can't compete with it. His seller, for example. But Rothbard recognizes, but this still doesn't get us to any kind of reasonable simulation of what patents are like because it wouldn't stop third parties who learn about this mousetrap because it's on the market now, right? So what he says is, aha, but under, under property law, you only have the right to sell what you own. So, for example, in the case we had earlier, if you agree to let me have a right-of-way over your land, like say for, for life or forever – then you sell your land. You have to sell it to someone subject to that right of way. You can't sell more than you own. You can't sell the whole property free of the right of way because now you've divided it up. So Rothbard analogizes that to the case of the mousetrap, and he says, "Well, the the, the buyer of the mousetrap didn't have the right to copy. So if someone else sees it, they can't get the right to copy from that. So you can see that's the next step in his argument. It makes no sense whatsoever. I don't need the right to copy to copy it." I gained information in a peaceful way. I observed someone's mousetrap. I learned something about the world. I learned that it's possible to configure metal and wood and springs and things in a certain way that has a certain effect. That's just knowledge about cause and effect in the world. And there's, I have never entered into any – just by observing a physical object, I didn't enter into any contract with the buyer, with the seller, with anyone. I didn't violate anyone's property borders. I didn't commit a tort. I didn't invade anything. So there's no there's no basis that that the seller or the buyer could insist on me not using that knowledge, however I see fit. Yeah, let's uh, let's focus on the Ron Paul versus Ron Paul dot com argument. Obviously, great stuff on the. Uh, I agree with you on on the uh, intellectual property arguments, but you know, wh wh where's your stance on the Ron Paul versus Ron Paul dot com issue? Um, so, I think the right way to look at it is. Um, uh, we, we have a internet that is largely free market, but has been, um, of course, is under government oversight in various ways. Um, of course, the government's threatening to tax now. They, they're <laughs> threatening to, they, there's this agency called ICE, IC, Immigration and Custom Enforcement. They shut down two, three hundred sites a year. They just, you'll go to these sites, they're just shut down with a big, scary, fascist, you know, logo up there. And that's usually because they, they they have links or ability to sell trademark counterfeited goods, or they have child pornography or online gambling or something like that. So the government has various hooks into controlling the Internet, and there's a CISPA, C-I-S-P-A, coming up, which the government is trying to use to control freedom of speech and what people can do. SOPA was a threat to the Internet, which is probably going to come back under ACTA, the Counterfeiting Treaty, or the the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I mean, I hate all these acronyms, but <laughs> these guys are relentless. So the government has its hooks in the Internet. And, of course, one of, one of the hooks they have into the Internet is their manipulation and subtle fascist control. And I mean fascist in a literal sense. You know, fascism is the idea that you have nominal private ownership of, of capital goods and factories and industry, but the government basically pulls the strings behind the scenes. And we have creeping fascism in the West because we have... Uh, with with tax law and regulations, we have an increasing creeping control by the state of what corporations do. Like when they twist Google's arm to give a, a customer's IP address, um, or or what have you. So what happened was um, in the I think it was in the, uh, uh, the in the Clinton Bush transition time, uh, the ICANN uh, or the the previous uh, agency in charge of assigning names to internet protocol addresses on the internet was transitioned to a private corporation, sort of like the Fed is private. So that's called ICANN. 
Now, this is a nominally private agency, but it's got like 111 governments on its advisory board. Okay, And when they formed, the governments insisted that ICANN adopt certain uh, dispute resolution rules designed to protect trademark. Now, trademark is another type of IP, state IP, which is completely unlibertarian and illegitimate, in my opinion. Uh, and so you have basically under our current system, there is this background uh, UDRP, Uniform Dispute Resolution Process, which everyone has no choice but to agree to to even get a domain. Okay, And what that means is it's, it, it's really just another mechanism for enforcing trademark. What it says is that if – if you have some kind of trademark claim to a certain name and you can show other things like certain bad faith or whatever on the part of the a current domain holder, then ICANN will agree to tran to transfer you know ownership. I, I put ownership in quotes uh, of the domain from the current owner to the new claimant. okay So you, you have a situation that is the total result of the state influence over ICANN and the internet. And the state IP laws, which is insisted on weaving into the fabric of these domain rules. So uh, you, it's inconceivable to imagine anything like this happening in a free Internet without the state involvement. So, But we have this system now. Just like we have in private life, you, know, you have the ability, if you have enough clout, let's say, you can go to the IRS tomorrow and you can rat your neighbor out for violating – cheating on his taxes. You can get a reward. You have that right. It's a legal right. Should you use it as a private citizen? I don't think so. Should, would that be the type of right anyone could exercise in a free society? No, because there wouldn't be a state and there wouldn't be taxes. Or if you have enough clout, like your Walmart, and you want this piece of land to build a new store, and the seller won't sell it to you, you can go to the city council and get them to take it by eminent domain. Right? Should yeah. you do that? I don't think so. Is it reasonable to expect that if you have eminent domain laws, people are going to take advantage of it? Yes. Uh, is, is it, you know, if you have uh, the IRS with bounties being paid to private citizens for ratting out their neighbors, do you think some people are going to take advantage of it? Yes. I mean, if you have a welfare system, are you going to have people sign up? Yes. So, you know, is the problem with having a welfare system that people sign up for it? No, that's not the problem. The problem is having a welfare system. So to me, the fundamental problem is state intellectual property law and state involvement with the internet. So in, in this case, Ron Paul has used that process to appeal to the, the WIPO, the, the, the United Nations body charged as being one of the agencies that can enforce these dispute resolution rules of the ICANN. He's gone to the UN agency to ask them to – Take the domain ronpaul.com and ronpaul.org away from the current uh, owners, I'll say, and give it to him. So wh whether he should do this ethically or practically or not, I can't say. I'm not an ethics expert. I think it's, I think it's a shitty thing to do. Um, but you know, the problem is not his doing it. The problem is having the rules in the first place that would never exist in a free market. Well, you know, here, here's one thing. Um I'm not the only Mike Shanklin in the world, mm -hmm. but if somebody else owns Mike Shanklin, even if it's not a Mike Shanklin, I can't just sue them and, and get the website. You see what I'm saying? That nobody would just yeah, give it you to don't, me. You don't have a. You would have to show you have a. Tra According to the rules, you would have to show number one that you have a trademark in your name. Now, Ron Paul, in this particular case, I read the complaint. He actually doesn't have a federally or even state registered trademark. See, there's a process by which you can apply. Like he. He's claiming common law trademark rights in Ron Paul, his name, because he used it in a commercial way for some period of time. Right. So he's a he's a chow, he's established a degree of fame and a degree of common law trademark rights. Now whether he will prevail in that argument, I don't know. I think that he has to pass two other tests like bad faith on the part of a registrant, um, and I think he's got an uphill battle. I think he's probably going to lose, um, and I hope he loses because I think this this law is wrong. This and that's effectively what it is. Everyone says it's a private contract, and everyone agrees to it. Yeah, that's true. And you know, back in the days of Jim Crow, um, uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of uh, uh, racist and uh, anti-Semitic uh, restrictive covenants were, in a way, augmented and supported by the state, or if not required in some cases. 
right? I mean, look, if the government, um, if if the government says that, um, um, you know, every, you know, like in let's say Nazi Germany, it says that every real estate rental or every apartment rental contract has to have into it this clause that uh, any Jewish tenant can be kicked out by any Aryan who really needs it more. I mean, then that would be the condition that every Jew who's a tenant of the apartment would agree to because he has no choice because the government has made this a universal practice that the free market would never adopt or couldn't adopt so easily, at least without some defection. Right. So to my mind, not to analogize this to, the, to, to that situation, but the point is it, it's, this is not a private contract situation. This is the result of government meddling and intellectual property law. And by the way, Trademark law is even harder to justify than patent and copyright, although it does less damage, in my opinion. Patent and copyright do the most damage in a dollar basis or in a civil liberties basis. Trademark law is terrible. It is used for censorship. It is used for um, uh, uh, stopping competition, but it's not nearly as damaging as the others. But it's even harder to justify because um, everyone says, well, shouldn't fraud be illegal? I'm like, yeah, well, they just make fraud illegal. <laughs> And they're like, well, because trademark law doesn't require you to show fraud. So, for example, you know, uh, you have the federal government customs agency seizing like shiploads of like fake purses, for example, like Louis Vuitton purses or Chanel purses or whatever, because they're counterfeit, but they violate trademark. Well, who are they? Pers who are these purses going to be sold to? Someone like in a back alley somewhere at the dock in Turkey. I mean, for ten bucks a bag, right? These people are not defrauded. If you buy a ten dollar Rolex watch on the street in New York, you know it's a fake. Yeah, right. There is no fraud whatsoever there. Everyone knows exactly what they're getting. So if you support trademark law, you support you know Rolex being able to stop that sale of a fake Rolex from a from a vendor to a to a customer who is not defrauded at all. So what's the basis for it? What's the libertarian basis? You can't say, well, fraud should be wrong illegal. Like okay, fraud should be illegal. Huh. Well, show it, prove it. It's, there's no fraud in trademark cases. Yeah, good, good stuff. That's amazing. I love that. Good, good, good topics today. Hopefully, I can have you on in the future. I always give uh, all my interviewees a chance to give plugs, you know, for for their websites and a two to three minute closing statement. So if, if this is the last chance you were going to speak, you're on your deathbed and you wanted <laughs> people to hear something for two minutes, go for it. On my deathbed, I'm pledging to say I wish I had put more time in at the office just to be a smart ass. <laughs> That's funny. Because <laughs> everyone says – no one ever says that. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I started a podcast recently um, it's, it's at stephankinsella.com. It's called Kinsella on Liberty, so I'm doing that uh, on a re fairly regular basis right now, and I'll probably duplicate this in our podcast feed. So just go to stephankinsella.com, um, and I am um, – uh, you can check out uh, – if you want to look into intellectual property material, go to c4sif.org. That's the number four, c4sif.org. But other than that, I'm just uh, working on some a few writing projects, not all IP-related, and um, happy to be here. I'd be happy to uh, to revisit you know this or some other topic someday. No, sounds good. Thank you so much for being on the show today, and uh, we will have you back on the show soon. Don't worry about that. Sure, Michael. Enjoyed it. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Guys, thanks you, thank you so much for checking out Triple V. As you guys know, all of these videos are free. If you guys want to contribute or donate, go over to voluntaryvirtues.com. You can actually find the schedule coming up tomorrow. I think I have Jeffrey Tucker, and then I have Lawrence Reed from Fee, and then I have Stefan Molyneux, and then Walter Block. So the interviews this, this uh, week and month are going to be pretty good. So uh, always looking for, for more uh, user and viewer Interaction. I think it's very important for us to have to spread these these videos and these articles and get them out to more people. Obviously, it's uh, some topics that more people need to understand and hear about. So, you guys can also find me and about 30 other admins over at Statism is Slavery. Statism is Slavery just hit 14,000 fans. Uh, we're almost at 15,000, so it's constantly growing exponentially. And I want to thank everybody who has helped us in that venture. Also, we also have free Anarchy and NYC tickets. As you guys know, I'm going to be a speaker over in New York City here in April. I was actually given the opportunity to give away four tickets. And uh, actually, with, with Mr. Panzella, he was on my show the other day, and I did give away two of those tickets, so I have two left. So anybody who wants to do those tickets, you guys can do a video contest for the best advertisement 
an uh, advertising Anarchy in NYC, and the winner is, and it's obviously uh, my my judgment, so I, I'm going to try not to be biased, but uh, the winner will get uh, one ticket each, so there's going to be two winners in that, so uh, head over to that video, I'm going to include it right here in this section, so you guys can just click on that and go check out that video, and uh, hopefully you guys are the winners of the Anarchy in NYC tickets, and I will see you in, in New York City here in a couple months, but thank you guys so much for checking out Triple V, and as you guys know, I will see you tomorrow, have a great day, bye. Thank you.